Okay, thanks. So here we are kind of switching gears to something more practical and I'm going to give you a little overview of fiber optic uh, systems and applications to tunnels but also to other geotechnical and structural applications. Um, why fiber optic sensors? There are so many technologies around to measure things. Uh, many of those technologies are well established and uh, and used for many years. So why fiber optic sensors have been introduced about 20 years ago? Uh, we will see some specific benefits later on, but in general, the common benefit of fiber optic sensor are in the small size, great variety of measured parameters, uh, distributed and multiplex topologies, so as we will see, the, they can cover large areas uh, with uh, high density of measurement points. They're insensitive to external perturbation, for example, electromagnetic disturbance, lightning strikes, etc. They can operate uh, reliably uh, in demanding environment with corrosion, high and low temperatures, etc. They can measure over long distances and they can interact or be compatible with data transmission uh, networks. There are almost, mm, for any measured parameters that can be measured with conventional sensor, there are probably one or more fiber optic sensors. For our purpose, the main interest are in strain deformation, force, temperature, chemical acceleration and rotations. These are the main parameters that are useful for uh, civil and geotechnical. The optical fibers that we use are very similar or identical to the ones that are used for data transmission. The idea is that the optical fiber is a glass wire that traps the light inside it. So when you put the light at one end, it will propagate into the fiber and it's getting reflected uh, at the surface between the core and the cladding of the fiber, and so the light can propagate along the fiber itself. Uh, the fiber is pretty small, is typically about uh, one eighth of a millimeter in diameter. Then we add external protections to make it uh, easy to manipulate and install. Um, but that's basically the technology that we're using in all the sensing technologies that I will uh, um, detail in the next. Uh, uh, slides. I subdivide fiber optic sensor in four main categories. The first one is the point sensor category. In this case, it's very similar co to a conventional sensor like a vibrating wire. We are measuring something at one location here, and then the optical fiber is just a wire. So it will bring the light from the instrument to the sensor, the sensor modifies the light, and then we send it back to the instrument. But the fiber itself is only used as a way of transmitting the data. An example of that is the fabri perot technology. A second category is the multiplexed or quasi-distributed sensor, for example, with fiber bright grating. These, again, we have discrete location where we are sensing, and the fiber connects those locations um, back to the instrument. So also in this case, we are talking about point sensors, but now we can have multiple sensors along the length of the, uh, of the fiber. Then we have the long base sensor, such as the SOFO technology. In this case, the fiber itself becomes a sensor. So we are measuring, for example, elongation by measuring how the fiber gets longer and shorter. So it allows us to monitor, for example, our column. We can have a sensor from the top to the bottom, and measure the wall change of length of the column itself. And finally, we have the distributed sensor uh, based on Brillouin and Raman scattering. And in this case, we can measure every meter along the fiber strain and temperature. So these are very useful to detect cracks, to detect leaks, to localize events rather than measuring something. So now I will give you a little more information about each one of these. And the presentation is very much oriented to applications, so I will maybe not explain in detail how it works from a physical point of view, but show you examples of how these different technologies are used in practice. 
So let's start with the point sensor or Fabry Perot interferometer. Uh, these are sensors that are somehow a one to one replacement of conventional vibrating wire sensors. Uh, the measurement principle is based on a cavity. So we create a gap between two fibers that are close to each other, and then we send the light into the, uh, into the fiber itself, and some of the light will be reflected by the first uh, mirror, and part of the light will be reflected by the second mirror. And then we use an instrument to measure precisely the distance between these two, uh, these two phases of the fiber. So here you see a couple of examples of the instruments. And in, based on that principle, we can build different types of sensors. So for example, if we want to make a strain gauge, we attach those two fibers at those two locations. And now if I apply strain to my sensor, this gap will change, and then we can measure the strain because the distance between the fibers is changing. If I want to do a temperature sensor, I now use a fiber which has a different thermal expansion coefficient. So for example, when the temperature increases, this fiber will elongate and this gap will close. So in this way, I can transform a temperature change into a change in the gap. Then I can make a piezometer or pressure sensor. In this case, I have a membrane that deforms. So when I apply pressure, my fiber is coming here, and this distance will change in relation with the pressure change uh, on the outside. And finally, this is somehow distorted, but um, in this case, we can have a displacement in this direction, and using a wedge, I can change the distance here uh, according to the position. So I, I can make a replacement of a um, potentiometer, for example, to measure expansion joints or uh, rod extensometers. So the main advantage of this technology is high resolution and accuracy. It's an absolute measurement and is temperature insensitive. So it's been used a lot to replace conventional sensors uh, in civil and geotechnical application. And I would say in particular it has been used in those cases where using vibrating wire sensor is difficult. And there are two main uh, applications. One is where there's lightning strikes, for example, in dams and slopes and dikes. Uh, and the second one is where you need to use very long cables. Uh, very long cables are easy for fiber optics and also cheaper. Fiber optic cable is less expensive than copper cable. So if you need to go very far, uh, this solution is uh, more cost effective. Uh, one of the challenges is multiplexing. So basically, this uh, technology needs one cable for each sensing point. An example from Chile. So that's close to your... Um, area, but more in the north. So here we're talking about mining application. Uh, piezometers that are used in tailing dams. And this, in this case, the main reason was to um, have protection against lightning strikes. In similar projects, uh, the owner had lost a lot of piezometers due to lightning strikes, so they decided to go fiber optic. Um, here's a picture of the valley where the uh, tailing dam will be built and the, the, the dam itself will fill all this valley. And you can imagine if I have piezometers at the bottom of the dam, they must be connected to the top. So we're also talking about uh, very long uh, cables. Uh, and that's, again, uh, uh, an interesting application for fiber optics. The piezometers themselves have nothing special about them. They're installed in the same way as a conventional vibrating wire sensor. And uh, the only difference is that they built these very strong cable ducts to allow the uh, cables to uh, remain undamaged even when the wall dam will be built on top of the, of the dam itself. Installation of the piezometer is identical to uh, installation of conventional piezometers, so nothing to say about this one. Here's an interesting picture. Um, showing the data acquisition system. What is also unique about these fiber optic piezometer is that they can be measured at very high speed. 
And so in this case, they were also interested to see during earthquakes how the uh, pore water pressure would uh, react to the earthquake. And so we have some of the sensors that are connected to this uh, high-speed data acquisition system. They are triggered by a strong motion uh, sensor. So when an earthquake uh, starts, we can acquire data at one kilohertz on the piezometer to see the waves of pressure going through the dam. So it was a kind of special application where there are some additional advantages of using fiber optic uh, piezometers. Second technology that I'd like to discuss is fiber bracket rating. Um, it's relatively similar to the previous one, but now we can have multiple sensors on the same optical fiber. The measurement principle is slightly different. Instead of having a gap between the two fibers, we now have a grating written into the core of the optical fiber. A grating is a kind of uh, periodic change in density. Uh, we write it using UV light. And this element is acting like an optical filter. So when I send light with different colors into the optical fiber, most of those colors will pass through the grating without being affected. But there's one very specific wavelength or color, in this case yellow, that is reflected back. And that's the wavelengths that correspond to the pitch of the grating itself. So now if I apply strain to my fiber, this pitch will change and therefore also the reflected wavelengths will change. So in this way, we can correlate the reflected wavelengths to the strain or the temperature uh, of the grating itself. And now the beauty of this is that I can put gratings with different wavelengths or different pitches along the fiber. In general, you can think between 10 and 20 sensors and they can re each one will reflect a different wavelength, and therefore the interrogator can address each uh, sensor individually. It's a little bit like a radio, so each station is transmitting on a different frequency, and so by tuning to one station or the other, I can measure the sensor independently. Of course, I can also have multiple lines. So in this case, I have uh, an instrument with four channels, on each channel, I can have 20 sensors. So in total, I could have 80 sensors installed on this, uh, particular, in this particular case. A couple of examples of sensors for temperature and strain and readout units uh, for permanent installation, for example. They are very similar to a data logger that you might use for uh, electrical uh, sensors, but in this case, we are taking optical signals. The advantage of this technology is the inline multiplexing, and this can reduce the length of cable. Imagine if you have 10 sensors or 10 temperature sensor or 10 strain sensor along a line, Instead of having a cable from the readout to the first sensor, from the readout to the second, from the readout to the third, you just have one cable going from one to the other. So it becomes like a bus, uh, an optical bus, where you have several sensors. It's also been used a lot for embedding in composite materials. So if you use composite to reinforce structures, this sensor is very small and can be embedded in the composite itself. Um, it's been used a lot in difficult environment, including oil and gas uh, industry. There are two drawbacks of this technology. One is that the sensor is sensitive to both strain and temperature. So if you are measuring in uh, an application where the temperature changes, uh, you typically need to install a temperature sensor close to the strain sensor to um, compensate the temperature effect on the uh, strain sensor. And also, the uh, readout unit uh, needs to measure wavelengths very accurately. So for long-term stable measurement, the readout unit uh, needs to be uh, built properly so that you can ensure the long-term uh, stability of these measurements. Here's an example of monitoring a rock slide in, uh, in Switzerland, um, that where we installed one of these uh, uh, fiber brag rating systems. In this case, we add the borehole into the ground, 
and we were measuring the formation at different depths. So it's somehow similar to a multi-point extens extensometer, except that now we can measure at any depth. So it's not relative to the surface, but we can measure, for example, from here to here, from here to here. Here is also redundant, so we have two chains of sensor in the same borehole, so that if something happens to one sensor, the other can take over. And then there are some other sensors that are surface attached and measure crack movement on, on the surface. So here we are, we're replacing, let's say, uh, vibrating wire joint meters with these uh, long gauge fiber optic sensors. Again, the advantage here is that we were in a high mountain, so problem with lightning strike, etc., pointed to the use of this uh, technology. A couple of examples here, you see the sensor bridging the crack, so it's attached here and here. Uh, these are just covers that are used to protect it. And uh, here is the borehole being drilled into the ground. And this is the uh, measurement system. Uh, it's not only for the fiber optic sensor, so that's why the solar panel is relatively large. Also, this uh, is located at very high altitude, so in the winter the snow will come to about this height, so that's why they needed this long pole to keep the um, solar panel above the snow level. Uh, we were talking about Canadian bridges, so here's another example of um, a bridge in Montreal that don't, doesn't look very, very, very safe or in very good condition is the infamous Turco interchange that is being replaced. It's a very important uh, interchange between two uh, highways in, uh, close to Montreal. Um, to give you an idea of how severe the condition of the bridge is, these nets here are installed to catch pieces of concrete falling off the bridge and trying to avoid it falling on the cars below the uh, the bridge itself. Uh, here you can see a number of sensors measuring cracks, horizontal and vertical, measuring movement between uh, uh, different sections, other shorter sensors over this crack here. Uh, so in this very sh uh, small location we have a number of sensors and as you can see they are interconnected. So the, the fiber goes from this one to this one, then this sensor, then this one, then the other one. So you can interconnect a number of sensors and then have just one cable going to the readout unit. In this case, uh, they were also interested in dynamic monitoring. So where you have trucks uh, going across the bridge, they wanted to see how the crack were opening and closing with the traffic uh, effects. In this case, you have a chain of sensor, and you can have deformation sensor, then a temperature sensor, then another deformation, another temperature, and so on. So it's possible to combine several type of measurements in the same line. And also you can see that these sensors are so-called double-ended. So you have the connection on both ends of the chain, so that, for example, if the sensor gets damaged here, we can measure the first two sensors from this end, and we can measure the other sensor from the other end. So it's a kind of redundancy in the connection of, of those sensors. Another example of monitoring a crack in a dam in Switzerland. Again, it's a borehole, and we are going to place the sensor right across a crack that is being detected in the rock underground, so we can uh, attach the sensor to a, a fiberglass rod and install it exactly at the location where we want to see the deformations. Moving on now to the uh, next uh, technology is the SOFO sensors. Uh, SOFO is a long gauge fiber optic sensors. So let me show you how it works. So the sensors are able to measure the formation between two points, and these points can be at as close as 20 centimeters or as far as uh, 10 meters apart. And so they can measure the deformation of wall structural elements, for example, the vertical uh, deformation of a column, or if you install it in a concrete bridge, you can measure the deformation of the concrete itself. 
uh, as in the example of the I-35 uh, bridge. On the bottom, you see different examples of readout units. This is a portable unit that can be used for uh, manual measurements, and these are example of permanent instrumentation, and here is a dynamic monitoring system to measure at very high speeds. The advantage of SOFO technology is that we can integrate the measurement of strain over longer distance, so it's appropriate to monitor concrete structures in particular, where maybe measuring locally might give you a local information that is affected by local defects or, or other, um, other changes that maybe are not representative of the whole structural element. Measure with high resolution, accuracy, and long-term stability. Uh, this is the technology that uh, was originally introduced by Smartec 20 years ago, and is still one of our um, main products. Uh, used a lot for monitoring concrete and uh, geotechnical structures. One of the issues with this technology is dynamic measurement. It's really designed for stable long-term monitoring, but it's not so easy to make a dynamic measurement uh, with, these, uh, with these sensors. In terms of using it for tunnel monitoring, uh, they can replace some other type of, of sensors. Here we see some examples of using them as extensometers. So they're placed into boreholes, so you can measure at different depths. One of the advantages of using it in that way is that there is no measurement head at this location. So the cables can be routed anywhere. Uh, the sensor can be covered with shotcrete, for example, so they are better protected during the uh, construction phases. So there is no transducer at the surface of the tunnel. Then we can also combine it with surface installed sensor or sensor embedded in the concrete. And these can be used to monitor also deformation or convergence of the tunnel based on the elongation of the sensor itself. And finally, you can combine it with tilt meter to have a full picture of the deformed shape of the tunnel itself. A couple of examples of use of uh, SOFA sensor for uh, tunnel excavation. Uh, here is a um, tunnel project in Switzerland for a dam where they ex excavated first this area, then this one, then this one, and finally number four. And so the sensors were installed immediately after digging each zone and then protected with shotcrete so that even if they were blasting zone number three pretty close to the sensor, uh, it was still possible to measure those, those sensors. Uh, installation was relatively easy, so make a borehole, insert the sensor, inject with grout, and then all the cables, for example here, the cables were routed along the tunnel and then covered with shotcrete, so there is nothing showing and it's uh, automatically protected from the blasting of the next uh, section of tunnel. So here are a couple of examples of how the deformation was captured. So we've seen in particular a large deformation in this area, very little on the other side, so there's probably some uh, geological formation that makes the tunnel uh, kind of rotate instead of just converging in, in one direction. Examples of installing sensor into elements of prefabricated concrete. Typically, we install pairs of sensor, one at the intrados and the other at the extrados of the, uh, of the concrete so that we can measure uh, curvature and then reconstruct uh, the deformation of the, uh, of the tunnel. Here's a project in Spain. Uh, it's also a um, tunnel for a um, hydro, hydropower dam. And there's a picture here that shows the sensor being installed. Uh, it's between the formwork and the uh, rock, and then it will be embedded in concrete. And one of the interests of this um, fiber optic sensor is that it doesn't need to be straight. So it can be installed also on a curved line. So in this example, for example, the sensor is measuring from here to here. 
So it measures the uh, integral deformation along that uh, deformed shape. So in this case, of course, you need to attach it at some intermediate point or embed it in concrete. So it can measure the, uh, the total deformed shape of the, of the concrete. That's another project in Belgium. Uh, here we chose a slightly different uh, installation. So with SOFO sensors, you have two options. Either you measure from one location to different depth, or you can have one sensor from here to here, a second one from here to here, and a third sensor from here to here. So there are advantages and drawbacks in each, uh, in each case. This is more redundant because uh, failure of one sensor doesn't affect the others, but at the same time is less accurate because you're covering longer, longer lengths. And we're also combining surface-mounted sensor in the, uh, in the concrete um, vault. A similar application for a waste, a nuclear waste disposal site in Switzerland. Again, sensor installed uh, in different directions, so it's possible to install them up upwards or downwards. And here you can see the sensor being prepared for installation. So we create a kind of um, bundle of the different sensors. So you have a sensor from here to here, another from here to here, and so on. Then they're installed in the borehole, injected, and then they, they can measure. You're probably familiar with the uh, new Alp Transit Tunnel in Switzerland. It's been opened uh, for a few months now and is the world's longest tunnel with 57 kilometers. Uh, I've been through the tunnel a couple of times already during some test uh, runs. And it's quite impressive how much time it's saved from Lugano, wh where I live, it's about here. And going to Zurich now it takes about 40 minutes less than it used uh, only a few months ago. And uh, a few years back, we were uh, involved in the project by instrumenting the portal area, so measuring the deformation of the concrete in the portal area and measuring deformation also in the shotcrete inside or at the beginning of the tunnel itself and in some other locations uh, uh, later on. So here you see a picture of uh, the, the portal area the uh, tunnel is entering uh, is, uh, in a way that is not perpendicular to the, to the slope, but rather at an angle. So they had to create these buttresses to hold back the, uh, the mountain, and so the, the tunnel would come in on this side. So you see the location where the sensors were installed. Here is during the installation. The sensors are attached to the rebar cage, and then they become embedded into the concrete couple of other pictures of that installation, a junction box where cables are connected. And here you can see the, um, uh, the recordings of the, uh, of the measurement. You have the initial phase of thermal expansion of concrete, cool down, shrinkage. These uh, oscillation are the daily temperature cycles. And then you can see that it stabilizes uh, after a few, uh, a few days. Some other sensors were installed inside the, the, um, the tunnel to measure the deformation due to the rock uh, pressure. And in this case, the sensors were embedded in shotcrete, so they can be installed on the rebars, and then they get covered with the shotcrete. In this case, they combined manual and automatic readings. This was about 12 years ago. Uh, so we had an initial reading, then some continuous measurement, and then some manual readings taken later on. Now with the uh, reduction of cost for the readout unit, I think in a case like this one, we would have installed a permanent uh, automatic monitoring system. A cotton cover tunnel example. Here is, uh, was an early example of use of high-performance concrete in Switzerland. And so this was a kind of monitoring slash research project. In this particular tunnel, they built half of the length with conventional concrete 
and the other half with high performance concrete. So they wanted to compare those two sections and they installed a number of sensors at different locations across the uh, cross section of the tunnel to monitor the uh, short term and long term uh, behavior of this, uh, of this uh, tunnel. Here you see some examples of detecting cracks forming in concrete. Again, you see the thermal expansion phase, then shortening, and when you see those jumps, they are typically cracks. And in this case, the formwork is still on the concrete, so you can observe cracking even before it, it can be uh, uh, seen uh, visually. Okay, so let's move on to the final uh, part of the presentation, which is dedicated to distributed sensing. So this is a very fascinating technology that opens some new opportunities in terms of uh, monitoring and um, mm, discovering defects on structures. Uh, the idea is simple but powerful. You can have one instrument located at one location, for example here, and then you can have a very long cable installed, for example, in this dike. And the cable is able to measure strain and temperature every meter over a distance that can be 20 or 30 kilometers. So now if you have, for example, 20 kilometer long cable, you have 20,000 measurement points along uh, the cable itself. Uh, and along this distance, you can measure different things. For example, if you are talking about this levee, you can measure water uh, going across the river, so a leak, uh, same for a pipeline. In the case of a tunnel or a bridge, you can detect cracks and localize where they are appearing. So it's a very useful technology to localize events like cracks or leaks or deformation or settlements. Um, I would say it's very useful where you are afraid of an event, for example, a settlement, but you have no idea where it might appear in a certain area. So with this technology, you can now cover the whole length of your slope, for example, like we see in this example here. And if there is a movement in this area, the system will alert you and will tell you where the deformation is occurring. So you can replace a large number of sensors. Sorry, this got completely screwed up. But the idea is to replace a number of point sensors with one single line of cable that can give you a picture, an overall picture of the uh, temperature distribution or strain distribution in your, in your structure. There are different types of instruments that can be used to cover different lengths. Um, typically from a few kilometers to uh, up to 75 kilometers, in particular for pipelines, can be very important to cover very long distances. The measurement principle is relatively simple. Uh, when you send a light down an optical fiber at a given wavelength or color, most of the light will simply travel through the fiber. That's what they're famous for, transmitting light. But there's always, uh, at every location along the fiber, a very small amount of light that gets scattered or interacts with the glass and gets diffused. And part of that light comes back in, towards the source of the light itself. And when you analyze the, the light that is coming back, you find that the original wavelengths, lambda zero, but you also find some new components that were not present in the original optical signal. They are called the Brillouin and the Raman uh, component. And they contain information about the temperature and the strain at this location where the scattering occurred. In particular, the Raman scattering is related to the movement of atoms in the glass of the fiber. So if the temperature increases in the, uh, in the fiber, the signal of the Raman increases. So there's more interaction between the light and the movements. And the brillouin scattering is related more to the distance between the atoms. So if you pull the fiber, uh, the uh, brillouin will move. So that's how we do a, a, strain, uh, a strain reading. To localize the events, we use a pulsed uh, technique. So we send a pulse of light into the fiber. 
and then we record the time of the scattering, of the back scattering. So if we send the pulse and it scatters at the location of one meter, the light will come back very quickly. And if it scatters at one kilometer, it will take a little longer. And if it scatters at 20 kilometers, it will take even longer. So by measuring the time, we know the location of our measurement. And by measuring the Brillouin uh, frequency or the Raman intensity, we can tell strain and temperature. And now if we combine these two information, we can tell, for example, that at this location, the temperature has increased because of a fire, for example, or that strain is increased at this location due to a crack, or temperature has decreased here due to a gas uh, leak, for example. So we can have a temperature and strain distribution along a very long uh, optical fiber. Here is an example of instruments. They can measure with good accuracy uh, in the order of 20 microstrain and one degree. It takes a few minutes to take a reading, and then you have the full uh, distribution of strain along the, uh, along the, uh, the fiber. I have here a couple of examples of cables that I will pass around. Uh, the top ones are strain sensors. So these are for surface attachment. It's a kind of uh, tape. Is the one you see on the left there. Uh, this is the one we used, for example, on the bridge in Sweden, where we detect the cracks uh, due to fatigue. And these other sensors are more designed for embedding in concrete or in the ground. So for example, these are the sensors that we have used in the tunnel here in Barcelona. Or this one is the one we use for the sinkhole project. And the bottom cables are for temperature monitoring. So the, in this case, the fiber doesn't need to be attached to, to the structure and can be free. So you, you can move the fiber in and out of the, um, of the cable. The last one is a special case. Uh, it also contains electrical cables. Uh, they are used to increase the temperature of the cable itself and is useful for detecting leaks from them, from dams. So what we do, we increase the temperature of the cable and we look how quickly it comes back to the, uh, to the original temperature. And if you have water moving around the cable, the temperature will drop more quickly. And if you have a dry condition, then the temperature will stay higher for a longer period of time. We also developed a graphical user interface to display the data from this type of instrument. As you can imagine, we need something a little special to display the data because we have so much data to show. And typically, nobody wants to see uh, the graph of the strain evolution at every point along 20 kilometers of cable. So what we do instead is a graphical representation where you can see in yellow or red the location where some thresholds have been exceeded. So the real advantage of this is the distributed uh, measurement. So again, it's very useful to localize things. Um, also, one advantage is that the cable itself is very low cost. Typically, it's just a few euros per meter to measure temperature and maybe around 10 euros per meter to measure strain. Uh, the instrument themselves are more expensive, so it's really justified for relatively long uh, distances. So if we're talking, for example, about a potential sliding area, you could be installing the sensor uh, along your slope. Maybe that's exaggerated. In reality, you would have only a couple of back and forth. And maybe if you have settlement, you can put the cable below the road. And now if you have a movement in your slope, the cable will get longer. And by measuring the strain, we can detect and localize where the movement is occurring. And in the case of a settlement uh, below the road surface, for example, is the same. The cable will get longer, and we can localize this, uh, this event, like we did, for example, for the sinkhole uh, project. In case of tunnels, the sensors can be installed essentially in three ways. First one is longitudinal, like we did in the tunnel here in Barcelona, so the sensor are installed along the tunnel, maybe in different position on the vault, 
so that if there is settlement or movement or crack, it will be detected <laughs> by one of the lines. Second type of installation is around the tunnel vault, like this. And the third one is in boreholes going inside the, the, uh, the soil or rock. And then you can interconnect all this cable together to form a network, and it can be read from one readout unit that is placed, for example, at the entrance of the tunnel. Here's an example of monitoring a penstock for a dam in Switzerland. We have installed the uh, red cable that is going around uh, inside the tunnel, and this tunnel is filled with water. So that's the tunnel that brings the water from the dam to the power plant. And uh, the sensor was glued to the surface and then protected with some uh, sealing material. And now water is running into the pipe, and we're measuring strain to detect cracks in the rock that might induce strain in the, uh, in the steel uh, liner of this, uh, of this tunnel. In this case, we have instrumented about 120 meters of tunnel with four lines. And so basically, we have about 500 meters of sensing uh, cable installed. So it corresponds to having 500 strain gauges installed. But of course, it's much easier to install this cable than 500 strain gauges, each one with his own cable, etc. cetera. Uh, again, the project here in Barcelona, you can see there's these columns uh, that are close to the wall. And the sensor is going uh, from the uh, wall to the column, back to the uh, wall, etc. So if there is any movement of these columns, it will stretch the cable here, and we get an alert. So it's an example of sur surface installation using this kind of uh, uh, brackets that keep the uh, fiber in place. Uh, so it's an alternative to embedding. You can also have a surface, uh, a surface mounting. Here's the project um, uh, for crack monitoring of um, the steel bridge. In this case, is a project in Manitoba in uh, Canada. Sensor installed along the uh, lower uh, part of the beam, covered with uh, aluminum tape, and then was repainted. So it doesn't, you cannot even see that the sensor is installed. And this one also has been monitoring for cracks for a number of years. We've already discussed uh, this project. is uh, now been in continuous operation since 2008, measuring every two hours the wall bridge and alerting in case of cracks. And here in a little more detail, the application to sinkhole monitoring. So you see here the road and one of the railway lines. And here's how we install the cable. We use a trenching machine to make a trench in the ground. Then the cable was installed into the ground. And then you close the ground. And when a sinkhole forms, the cable gets elongated. And you get a reading, and you understand the location of a potential, of a potential sinkhole. Okay, we'll skip this one. This is a graphical user interface. Again, it's designed for quick uh, understanding of the location of issues. So for example, if uh, a sinkhole was forming at this location, it would turn red here, and you would get an email and, or an SMS or whatever. And then you can immediately see the location of the potential problem. So you can decide what is the best action if you want to stop the traffic on the railway line, or send an inspector to have a closer look, etc. Here's a dam in uh, Latvia, where they also had issues with uh, cracks appearing in that uh, pretty old dam. And in this case, we have installed the tape sensor, also with brackets, to uh, <laughs> localize cracks that might appear in the dam itself. An example of monitoring landslide. This is a project we did in Korea. Um, in this case, the sensor was surface mounted, but uh, using anchors that were going inside the uh, slope. And um, let me see if there is a graph. Yes. 
uh, when you compare the strain in different uh, times, before and after the, the slide, you can see that in this location we have an elongation of the cable here and a shortening of the cable in the next session, section. So you can see that the, this pole has moved uh, this way. So it's not so easy maybe to uh, analyze the result from this, but you can see that in this area, the measurement before and after are practically superimposed, so nothing is moving here. But in this area, you can see that the two measurements are different, so you can conclude that something is moving in, in this area. So I, I, I would like to stress again that probably not a uh, sensor designed to quantify things, but more to localize where movement is occurring. Then once you know that that area is moving, maybe you can install a laser distance meter or crack meter or whatever. But if you have no knowledge beforehand of where the movement will occur, this technology can be, uh, can be helpful. OK, so this brings me to the conclusion of my presentation. Fiber optic sensors are relatively new compared to other technologies, but they've been around now for more than 20 years. And I hope I have shown you a number of successful applications of them for structural and geotechnical monitoring and instrumentation. Uh, there's not a single technology, but a number of different fiber optic technologies. We have covered the four uh, main ones, point sensor, uh, fiber brack rating, long gauge sensor, and distributed sensor. And each one of them has its own application, advantages, and drawbacks. Uh, some unique features of fiber optic sensing, uh, including distributed sensing, open new op application possibilities that were not possible with conventional technology. And typically, we use fiber optic sensor in cases where conventional sensor have some limitation in terms of reliability in difficult environment, long-term stability, compatibility with lightning strikes, etc., and sometimes. Uh, Fiber optic can also have low, lower system cost, in particular where we're talking about large number of sensors or very long cables. Our company uh, is selling both traditional vibrating wire sensor, for example, and fiber optic. So I'm not here to tell you that fiber optic is the solution to all problems. In many cases where a traditional sensor like this vibrating wire piezometer works, there's no reason to switch to fiber optic. But in cases where there are some limitations uh, in the use of conventional technologies or where you need the advantages of distributed sensing, then going fiber optics can be a good, uh, a good solution. Uh, if you're interested in going a little deeper, we have written with my colleague Branko Glisic uh, a book about fiber optic methods for structural health monitoring. Uh, you can buy the book, and if you ask me, I can give you it on a USB stick, although the publisher might not be super happy about that solution. But if you're interested, come to me, and um, uh, we will find a way to let you have a, a copy of the book. Thank you very much, and um, if you have any questions... Um, okay, thank you. Oh, I'm almost on time. Questions? Eh, felicitaciones por tan excelente presentación. Eh, mi inquietud es respecto a los rangos de valores que se pueden obtener con la fibra óptica respecto a otros dispositivos. Por ejemplo, en desplazamientos. Eh, en algunos dispositivos se pierde se pierden los valores cuando cuando el, cuando el desplazamiento es muy grande uh -huh. y este se rompe ¿Sí? entonces eh, con la fibra óptica obtenemos, obtenemos otras ventajas o sea hay un mayor rango de valores o, o cómo estamos allí okay. so the fiber itself can measure about two percent elongation <laughs> before breaking so over one meter you can measure about two centimeters elongation but there are ways around that, and I skipped uh, one slide here. In this case of the sinkhole monitoring, we designed the cable in a way that it will move into the ground. 
so what happens is when you start pulling your fiber, initially you get strain over a short uh, length of fiber, but if you pull even more, the strain gets distributed over a longer length, as you can see here. So we program the cable to uh, somehow redistribute the strain instead of breaking. So in this case, we're not measuring the strain accurately, but uh, we can save the cable even if there is a very large deformation. So there is a compromise between the accuracy. So if you want something very accurate, maybe you will use the tape sensor or the, uh, the red sensor that is attached, but that can measure only 2%. If you want to measure larger deformation or survive larger deformation, then you can use something like this. So you need a compromise between surviving and accuracy. <coughs> Hi, Daniel. Um, fatigue crack monitoring. Mm -hmm. Have you found any fatigue cracks on that Manitoba bridge? Yeah, How exactly big? one. <laughs> okay. Um, my concern is fatigue cracking is, it, it, it starts um, microscopically small. It's not detectable mm -hmm. by the eye. It is detectable by magnetic particle mm -hmm. imaging. Um, but you can't do MPI because you've covered it with tape. And I don't think your um, system will detect it early enough. No, that's not uh, how we did it. So we were detected. We were detecting microscopic cracks that are visible to the eye. Uh, what happens in this particular bridge is that they calculated that because of the um, the way the beams are placed, even if there's a crack, it's not dramatic, but they want to know it so they can repair it. So it's not, uh, let's say, fatigue critical in the, in the sense that the first crack will make the bridge fail, but uh, you don't want to have three cracks in the same span, for example. So we want to detect the first one when it's micros um, is microscopically visible. So I would say an, an inspector would see it as well, but you don't want to inspect that bridge every hour. So that's was the purpose of the monitoring system. Not to detect micro cracks, but as soon as they become significant. So it might not be applicable to all cases. Uh, if it's fatigue uh, critical structure, that's, I think there's no monitoring system that can catch it. Maybe some of these NDT uh, solutions are the only approach. So probably a design error if you have a structure that fails on the first crack. <laughs> that happens. But there are structures like this, unfortunately, around the world. In Italian. Eh, I get italiano? a in Italian, yes. <laughs> <laughs> eh, beh, mi associo anch'io i complimenti per entrambe le esposizioni. Volevo chiedere, eh, le modalità di applicazione di questi sensori sulle strutture esistenti, mm -hmm. eh, sia a calcestruzzo che acciaio, se ci sono, che prodotti si usano, se sono incollate, sono fissate, mm -hmm. perché alcuni sensori poi lavorano in, man su un in maniera distribuita, mm -hmm. quindi devono essere fissati in maniera continua, mm -hmm. penso, eh, perché no, non okay. sono specializzato ecco, a capire se è un punto può essere una criticità le modalità, le modalità di fissaggio e se serve personale specializzato per l'installazione. Ok, so the question is how you install sensors on existing structures, in particular the distributed sensors. Uh, there are two or three main ways to install sensors on the surface. Uh, first one is to glue it on the surface. It must be glued along the wall length so that it can measure both compression and elongation. Uh, that's one solution. Second one is with uh, discrete uh, attachment points, like we've seen in some of the application with these L brackets. In this case, we pretension the cable before attaching it so that it can measure also compression. And another technique that is very useful in concrete, for example, is to make a groove. So we cut a groove with um, how do you call it? a saw and put the sensor in and cover it with mortar 
So the sensor is embedded uh, slightly below the, the surface. That's very useful for very long installations because you can set up a vehicle that cuts a small, uh, like two centimeter deep uh, cut, put the cable in and grout it in place. Uh, in terms of what is needed, uh, in terms of knowledge and personnel, yes, you need a little bit of spe specialization, I would say. But for example, the tunnel we instrumented here, or the bridges, we had one of our engineers go there for a couple of days at the beginning of the project to train uh, the local people, but after that they could install it by themselves. There's nothing so difficult about installing these sensors. They can be repaired also if something breaks, we have ways of fixing or splicing the fiber together. So yeah, it's different from other technologies. So the first time you see it, you need a little bit of training, but after that it's not very difficult to install. Eh, eh, a ver, bueno, una serie de preguntas, pero vamos a irnos a, a dos. Eh, no sé si puedes buscar, mientras te pregunto la primera, eh, la fotografía del puente donde estás monitoreando el agritamiento, donde está el, la pilastra ahí a la vista con la enferradura. I don't have the... Can you translate for me? I don't have the... Maybe you can help me. Okay. Uh, ¿qué, ¿Qué puente? Ah, si, si, puede. si puedes sí. buscar la fotografía, mientras tanto, de la estructura. ¿Esta? No, no, no. Eh, mostraste donde había una estructura con la pilastra, digamos, con enferradura a la vista. En Canadá, sí. Uh, ¿Esta? No. Oh, yes, the turco, yes. Okay. Uh, 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 por favor, uh, aproveche la, la otra respecto a los taludes que pasaste. Ajá. Ok. Sí, eh, lo que mostraste que es bastante gráfico y bastante bueno, pero cuando tú tienes un talud que está semi revestido, uh -huh. ¿cierto?, por mallas de sostenimiento y perno, ¿tú tienes que colocar la fibra óptica por debajo o la puedes colocar encima? salvando esta situación. Y lo otro es que eh, me imagino yo que la fibra óptica copia el manto, uh -huh. que no es parejo, sí. ¿verdad? La fibra óptica, pero no la puedes quebrar. Sí. ¿Cómo you, es you eso? Can, digamos? Yeah. Yes, the fiber can follow the shape of the, of, the, um, of the structure. So depending on what's on the surface, you might have different installation techniques. So if it's a concrete, you can have this cut and put the fiber in. If it's a natural slope, um, you can put these anchors in the ground and attach it on the surface. So we need to see uh, a specific case to design how you install it. Or maybe for this one, you can cut a groove with the trenching machine and put the cable in. So there's no single answer to that. But yes, the cable needs to be uh, attached somehow to the slope so that it can sense the deformations. So there is some installation required and might be difficult in some cases, but once it's installed, then you have a, a very easy way to detect movements and localize them. So, and you had a question about the other the bridge? Si. Let's see if I can find it. We're getting close. Very close. Very, very close. Sí. Yeah, this one. <laughs> sí, lo que pasa es que mientras hacía la exposición, mi colega aquí me decía, ese es un puente nuestro porque tenemos una condición como esa. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> la verdad es que en esta exposición estamos al desnudo, así que no ha sido bueno. <laughs> Pero, a ver, aquí tú haces monitoreo de agrietamiento, ¿correcto? De... Deformation, opening of cracks. Deformación. Sí, del, deformación. De, de la grieta, ¿verdad? Sí. Sí, pero es que aquí se da un fenómeno, aquí hay dos tipos de agrietamiento, ¿cierto? Uno es el agrietamiento superficial, uh -huh. producto, digamos, de, de, de lo, de, del espesor, digamos, del recubrimiento, uh -huh. ¿verdad? Y luego tienes un agrietamiento estructural, 
que es la grieta que te importa, porque el agrietamiento superficial que veo ahí, ¿cierto? Porque nos pasó, uh -huh. es un agrietamiento, claro, es okay. serio, grave, digamos, pero me afecta ahí la enferradura. Uh -huh. Pero la que sí me importaría seguir con este sistema es la grieta estructural, digamos. Uh -huh. Entonces, yeah. aquí, ¿cómo yeah. eh, defines, that, digamos, that's... la... That's a very good question about the difference between surface and structural deformation. Uh, maybe it's not very clear, but the sensors are installed with uh, brackets, so it's mechanical components, and they are drilled deep into the concrete. So we try to attach to the inside and not only measure the surface movement. Uh, but of course, if the concrete is very massive, maybe inside the deformation might be different. In that case, we might have sensor on both sides and maybe do some uh, interpolation between the two. But it's not glued on the surface, it's drilled inside the, the concrete. Yeah? Um, I've got a question about, in the UK, we've had um, a lot of success. Um, Uh, in the UK, we had a lot of success with um, using um, uh, distributed fibres to uh, to attach to pile cages during the construction phase mm -hmm. uh, to to then monitor the, um, uh, the the heating and cooling associated with the pile curing. And if there's inclusions within the pile bore, which you may not know about, then it will give a different response to perhaps mm -hmm. you know an, a, an in a pile which is. Uh, is, is a good quality pile. Have you had similar experiences of using the technology in the same way? Yes, that's an interesting application. We did something similar in Switzerland by monitoring uh, temperature exchange piles. There's also a company that is using our temperature sensor to monitor the quality of uh, um, uh, jet, uh, jet grouting piles, how do you call it? These, the, these rotating jet because they can have different diameters, and so by measuring the temperature distribution, they can tell how large is the, uh, and they can also verify that it's really rotating regularly and eating the cable <laughs> every couple of seconds. So yes, there are many possible applications, like any new technology, you sometimes find good application and potential application that turn out to be a dead end, but yeah. There are many things that are related to strain or temperature and can be used indirectly maybe to um, have uh, an indication of quality during construction or defects later on, like a leak of water, for example, will change the temperature. Um, as you said, a change of diameter of the pile when the concrete sets will generate a different temperature. So by being a little bit creative about how you transform what you want to measure into something measurable in terms of strain and temperature, you can maybe find new application examples. And these are good examples also because it's a short-term application. So the only cost you have is the cable that is very cheap, and then the instrument you only need it during the setting of the concrete, and then you can move it to another pile. So it must be very cost-effective solution as well uh, compared to maybe other method of uh, non-destructive testing after the pile is built. Yep. One question about the, the installation of um, of your fever sensor, your cables in a um, steel uh, surface. What do you use to uh, to ensure that you have no no uh, relative slip? Well, for the bridges I showed, we did a lot of research, in particular to understand if we could attach the sensor on top of the paint because that was very important to the owner, because if you have to remove the paint, it's very expensive, but also you can create corrosion by installing the sensor, which would be rather stupid, of course. And we found that because the sensor is distributed uh, the, uh, and is contacting everywhere, slipping is very difficult, because, I mean, if you want to have slipping between the surface here, it should slip over the wall length. It should move everywhere. So that's an advantage of using distributed sensing. So we use an epoxy glue. The quality of paint should be good if the paint is falling off. Obviously, it's not a good, uh, a good case. But we can do it on top of the paint, and then we can cover it with a tape, aluminum tape, and repaint 
on top of the sensor. So it's even protected by paint again. Uh, again, if your paint is very thick or very bad quality, it probably doesn't work. But usually it can be applied on top of the, uh, of the paint. An epoxy glue uh, yeah. continues yes. over the, continues. the painting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Glue, tape, and then aluminum tape to cover it. Mm -hmm.